subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. He's actually more fondly known as DV, so that's how I'm going to be addressing him through the webinar. He is the director for design and RSP, which is one of the leading global uh, design firms, which is present in 12 countries. He's extremely respected in the field of architecture and has led uh, designing of projects both India and overseas for over two decades now. Uh, DV, welcome aboard. Uh, thank you, Kanika. Thank you, all the panelists, as well as all the people who are attending this webinar. Great. And uh, we have another interesting panelist with us, Kunal Chaudhary. He's a uh, director for Udhyan Chaudhary and Associates, uh, which has for decades advised clients in India and abroad on MEP design and solutions. Um, while Kunal is very young, he's already a guest lecturer at renowned architecture and engineering colleges. So Kunal, welcome aboard as well. Very glad to be here. Great. Uh, so before I ask any questions, um, I'd just like to quickly give a disclaimer and please bear with me for a minute. Uh, please understand that all the views that would be presented during the webinar are individual views of the participants. They may or may not uh, be same as the views of their firms. Um, also, I would request media or any other person not to quote these participants without their authorizations in any public forum. So great, uh, let's get going. Um, and before we're going to dive into the technical questions on design and MEP, I think it will be great if uh, we have some uh, context setting in terms of the problem statement for business uh, from uh, Amit and also in terms of health from Kunal. Uh, so my first question is actually to Amit. Uh, Amit, do you think working patterns have changed post-COVID? And um, of course, everyone talks about working from home. Do you think it's going to prolong in the medium and long run? Yeah. Um, thanks, Kanega. So firstly, I hope everyone watching this and your near ones are safe. Uh, I'd like to thank Speakin for organizing this. Uh, Kanika, you for moderating it and my co-panelists for joining me. I am delighted that this event is starting on time. And anybody who knows me well would say this is in this would make my day. So thank you, Speakin, for getting this on board on time. Um, see, Kanika, there are two types of jobs. Uh, there are one which can be performed efficiently at home and the other ones which cannot. And a lot of people who are in roles that can be performed from home are now habituated. And while they want to return to the workplace to collaborate with others or just to get out of the house, they actually may not mind working from home from time to time. But there's another group of people who cannot perform their roles from home efficiently because of the nature of their jobs. And they're either nervous about losing their jobs or they are currently helping increase the stock price of Netflix and Amazon during their workday. Uh, I believe that work from home is here to stay. There is no question in my mind. I think most of us have been positively surprised by the rapid adoption of technology and also the productivity while working remotely. Uh, but I believe that each company will solve for remote working differently according to their circumstances. And you know, while technology is great, it's really not a replacement for human interaction. And there's various other considerations like data security, internet bandwidth, creating a company culture, you know, hiring, mentoring young staff, etc. A lot has been published on this topic and there are several shortcomings of working from home as well. Uh, companies obviously will have to carefully assess the cost and benefit and take a call. And the solution will be different for every company. It may range from 0% remote working to 100% remote working. It's really hard to generalize. Uh, but what I must say is that this is definitely a turning point in how we all view the workplace. And in my opinion, the answer is not an either or. I think office and home office will continue to coexist in future. And we will definitely see more work from home. We will see more staggered work timings at office. And we will see more rotation policies. And, uh, you know, attend, attending office, uh, you know, some days a week, but not all. 
so i think in short it will be a hybrid and the each each company will solve for it differently based on their unique requirements right thank you amit um, i the uh, like to confess that i do add to the netflix stock uh, my toddler has been singing chao vela chao vela i think this entire lockdown so yes there are a lot of us like that uh, i think let's move on to um, a question that is very pertinent from health perspective that has been bothering um, uh, not just companies um, and their hr heads uh, but even design firms um so this question is um, for kunal uh, kunal uh, if you would just uh, shed light on in simple terms especially for non engineers like me what exactly is the problem statement for air conditioning and ventilation systems especially in the context of commercial real estate and uh, public spaces right so kanika to to begin with i think the problem statement can come in a little later but i think you need to understand what the virus is doing and how it's spreading right so okay. uh, the virus is a very simple positive sense rna virus which is protected by a lipid layer which is basically protein right and it's spreading through droplets and it's spreading through aerosols that are going airborne i think uh, you know the droplets being heavier they will go and settle on surfaces which we are calling fomite surfaces and then somebody can touch it and pick it up and and that's why the hand washing and the social distancing is so important right uh to give you a little more context on the virus itself uh, the size of the virus is very important okay i think that's something that that a lot of us need to understand uh it's only a, about 0.125 micrometer in diameter okay so that's very small uh to give you more context to that a human hair strand a single strand of hair is about 70 micron so that's about 1000 times smaller than a strand of hair right and about 20 times smaller than pm 2.5 that we've been all you know so scared about in delhi ncr every winter with with pollution so if you've not been able to tackle pm 2.5 very well you can just imagine how we'll we'll filter or tackle uh, you know the virus now the problem statement is basically the virus is getting airborne it is getting uh, you know people are getting infected while breathing it that's why the masks come into play very importantly and in enclosed buildings or not so well ventilated spaces what you have is uh, you know because of post ventilation or because of air conditioning drafts right so it it can go even farther than the 2 meter distance that we've been talking about so the 2 meter social distance might be very applicable outdoors but it may not be uh so applicable when you're indoors because the air conditioning system can can propel it maybe 30 40 50 meters away so the size of the virus and then the problem statement and there's a recent study uh, from the cdc which got published in the uh, washington post just about i think 2 3 days back and the the virus spread is more in the air and not off the surfaces according to that so so the risk of you getting covid 19 is more while you while you are indoors in enclosed spaces that are not well ventilated as opposed to the uh, popular belief that it's spreading off surfaces etc when you are you know touching it um the solution is pretty simple the virus is is just a very simple microorganism and from an hvac perspective we have probably three or four things that we can do uh we have to look at the temperature in rh we have to look at the outdoor air delivery we have to look at filtration of course like i mentioned and we have to look at some kind of real time disinfection uh through some human friendly oxidizers that don't harm people while they're inside so like i mean i can't start spraying uh, sodium hy- hypochlorite on people when they're working right so uh, that's not going to work so we need to figure that out so that's the problem statement in a nutshell okay all right understood uh, sorry we missed what rh is uh, could you tell us what you meant by rh yeah rh is basically relative humidity and uh, relative humidity what ishre wants you to maintain in any enclosed space is in the range of 40 to 70% and ishre is the indian society for heating refrigeration and air conditioning engineers which is a professional society and it's been writing uh, you know documents and and design guidelines for the government of india as well so it's a recommendation from from ishre okay and okay. the temperature that you're supposed to set 
for your air-conditioned spaces is anywhere between 24 degrees to 30 degrees. Now, I would like to highlight that, you know, this temperature range of 24 to 30 and the RH range of 40 to 70 is not killing the virus. It's not stopping the spread of the virus. What it's essentially doing is it's not allowing the virus droplets to dry up fast because if the RH is too low then the virus droplets could dry out really fast and then it can again become airborne. And uh, the virus being airborne is the main problem. Okay, great. So now that we have the problem statement in place, um, Amit, uh, let me first ask you, how do you think uh, that social distancing and working from home is going to impact the way we use our uh, commercial real estate space? Uh, sure. So uh, we're actually doing a lot of work on this topic, uh, both globally and in India with our other stakeholders. So our tenants, uh, our design partners, uh, our leasing partners. And uh, I think the use of commercial real estate has changed and will change for both parts, the common areas and the personal workspace. So I'll, I'll talk about usage only and I'll leave design for my other colleagues to talk about later. From a usage standpoint, there are three different behaviors we're observing. I think number one, individuals are keeping distance from others. The second is that they're avoiding to touch the surfaces that have been touched by others. And the third is that they're worried about breathing the same air as others in a confined space. And as Kunal said, this is the most dangerous of the three. But, you know, awareness may not be as common as, as you know, uh, on this panel. Um, now, all these three behaviors will directly impact their perception of how to live their life and how to use real estate, whether it's commercial or residential. And therefore, it has design implications. So I think the longer term impact on usage, I think is more a question of how long this crisis lasts for and you know how human psychology behaves. Because, you know, habits change easily. I mean, just what, like we got accustomed to working from home, uh, people may again start to become lax if there is a cure for the virus uh, through the production and distribution of, uh, of the um, vaccine. Uh, but I think whether the long-term usage behavior changes or not, the design changes required to the buildings are immediate and are real. Because at least for the foreseeable future, people will make their decisions on whether to lease and occupy a certain building bases their perception on how safe it is. And, you know, uh, I'll, I'll leave the design changes, you know, whether it's elevators or common area interactions, etc. cetera. I mean, DV is far better, uh, you know, place to answer on, on what the design changes would be. But this usage behavior has already changed. Okay. All right. Great. So DV, um, what has been the immediate response of your clients? Has it been more around design or has it been more around operations or has it been a mix? Um, well, we've been talking to a number of clients and uh, there are concerns. Uh, many of them have expressed. Um, I think the first thing is, like Amit said, look at what is the short term requirement and then look at what is the medium term and then go for the long term. In the immediate term, um, I think people are looking at what they can modify in their spaces, which is more operational in nature. So, you know, starting from, uh, and, and each building owner uh, in that sense, including Heinz, I'm sure, uh, wants to manage the whole uh, operations of their thing so that the building and its surrounding looks absolutely safe and secure for all their tenants. So what, what has happened is that most building owners uh, have asked for uh, installing thermal scanners, uh, giving uh, PPP equipment to some of their housekeeping staff who spray the cars as they enter. They're scared that cars will bring in, uh, you know, a virus back into their uh, office buildings. Um, they're looking at sanitizing areas throughout the entire uh, public areas and common areas. They're also uh, demanding that as part of the standard uh, standard operating process or procedure. Every tenant also uh, undertakes sanitization within their office at the end of every work shift uh, so that the building remains uh, safe. Um, obviously, the main 
criteria for all of this contactless. And every one of the uh, clients that we're talking about is looking at how contactless uh, interaction can happen uh, between people. So uh, at the entrance, uh, there are no more these contacting people uh, putting the uh, thermal scanners on you. So it's a thermal scanner. Uh, the security is happening through a, uh, one of the DFMID uh, measures. Uh, then as you walk in, there is always a sanitizer that we need to place. Uh, I think those designs of these dispensers are still pretty crude. Uh, they're still uh, put together very quickly. But over the years, I think as time goes by, over the months, uh, you will actually get them as uh, marketed products, uh, which are going with the interiors of the lobby. And, you know, uh, there will be more selection uh, that's going to happen with uh, some of these uh, things. Um, also, I think there's a lot of encouragement to look at uh, staggered uh, timings uh, for the people um, so that the offices don't start to get staffed up 100% very quickly. I know the lockdown rules now or the opening up rules now allow for uh, literally 100%, but I don't think offices are prepared to uh, be able to do that. Um, Definitely when you, and if I go one step further, as you move towards the elevators, the social distancing norms are being uh, enforced. Uh, there are signages, new signages that propped up in almost all the buildings where uh, people have to maintain their distance. Um, elevators remain a problem from a contact uh, perspective. Uh, there is no immediate design solution except to sanitize your hand after you touch your buttons. But uh, we've been talking to some elevator vendors as we move forward and uh, they are exploring technology of uh, using mobile phones, RFID or any other systems, uh, including uh, promotion of the uh, destination control because that allows for a better control of how many people go in our elevator. So those are, those are some of the uh, things that uh, everybody is talking about and we are also looking at how to uh, create the right environment for this. Um, cafeterias are another areas of concern. Uh, I, I believe what is really going to happen in the immediate future is people are going to be very uh, sitting in a cafeteria along with other people to uh, eat. So working or eating from your desk is the new norm at this point in time, and it's pretty much followed in our office where I'm also sitting right now, uh, as well as uh, packaged food instead of the standard buffet offering that uh, many offices do have in their uh, cafeteria. So those are some of the changes uh, that's right now immediate and, and then being taken care of uh, by most uh, developers as well as end user tenants uh, in, within their office. Uh, sorry, Kanik, I'm just going to jump in for a second, DV. I must appreciate uh, your uh, comments here and a uh, big shout out to my uh, colleagues who take care of property management and operations in the building. Um, all of the points you mentioned, we took care of about a month ago and therefore I must appreciate their efforts so that I completely lost track of the fact that there is an operations to take care of as well. We were ready to welcome our clients back, our tenants back a month ago and the mind space is all focused upon future developments of uh, buildings. So thank you for uh, reminding me how privileged and blessed I am to have colleagues like that. Thank you. Also, Amit, before I jump on to the next question, I would say that uh, One Horizon Center is uh, my favorite office building in the country. And I think the best grade A asset that there is out there. And Kunal and I were just talking about it yesterday that, yeah. It's a phenomenal building. Thank you so much. It's very kind of you. I have to say I'm blessed to have colleagues uh, who built that building. All right. Great. So, um, DV, our next question is to you. Um, mm -hmm. And sorry, I'd uh, request you to speak up a little. Uh, we couldn't, uh, you know, hear you okay. well. Um, okay. But um, I'll ask you the question. And then I'll give you the lifeline that uh, Amitabh Bachchan offers in Con Banega Karodpati. We are going to have an audience poll before we take your answer. Okay. So my question to you is that, um, you know, past few years we've seen a reduction in office space requirement 
per person in terms of square footage um, so numbers have let's say gone down uh, from 100 to 120 square feet a person to let's say 60 70 also another trend that came about was uh, to have more open office layouts rather than cubicles uh, so my question to you is um, whether any of these trends are going to reverse with covid and um, uh, sajal if you could help us with the audience poll way Sajal, do let us know when you have the results, and please do display these. You know, as uh, as we get the result, uh, let me let me outline uh, what my thinking uh, in this is. Um, you know, this crisis has hit us, um, and I I believe that uh, there is a lot more awareness that uh, people have today about virus, about how it spreads, and therefore there's a lot more fear that uh, they will they will contract the virus. But ultimately, uh, when it comes to a work uh, work fair, work play, workplace. um i think this is still a short term and that's my personal view i think over the time we'll probably uh, go back to the kind of densities uh, that we have uh, known i think the economics eventually will uh, drive people back to the 65 70 75 square feet maybe maybe it probably won't reach that level maybe it will be 90 but in the interim definitely uh, you know one is going to look at social distancing Okay, so we get the result. Um, yeah, so it's a it's a mixed bag. Uh, I don't think uh, there's a pillar. Uh, look at whether cubicles will be back or not. Um, but I'll answer that question slightly uh, differently. So the audience thinks that um, you know we will continue to have open plan layouts, but we'll have let's say transparent partitions in between. Yeah, and and that's interestingly already in the end. Well, uh, in fact, one of the ways how offices are tackling the social distancing issues, uh, even in the current circumstances, is um, through putting these transparent uh, partitions uh, between one work desk or a work workstation and the other, uh, and then maybe alternating the workstation so that there is uh, that six feet uh, distance that's maintained. We know that in the sixty-five, seventy square feet kind of model, uh, workstations tends to be anywhere between. 1200 to 1500 especially at least uh, in the bpo uh, operations or it operations but uh, uh, when you go out towards more corporate or towards more research oriented they tend to be in the 120 which is okay which which will not be impacted because you would get the necessary 6 feet social distancing rule um but this idea that you would have partitions um, which is like a sneeze guard uh, that's going to definitely be there i think for some time to come uh, now coming to the answer of the cubicle you know historically uh, much and uh, this is slightly controversial but i think the cubicle going away and the idea that you would have open office space has really been sold as an idea of collaboration or creativity and all that but in reality it is real estate in reality it's the cost of real estate so employees and others have been convinced that they are more productive when they are sharing space rather than being in their own cubicle mind you a lot of companies even before covid have already been talking about moving some of their people away from open workstations to uh, to cubicles uh, you know enclosed cubicles and then have very selective collaborative spaces where social interaction and other interaction Uh, happens so i think from a from a long term there is already a changing trend in my opinion to to move towards that uh, but what covid would probably do right now is push uh, towards some of the senior management moving back into their cabins 
who otherwise were uh, typically sitting uh, in an open office uh, environment. All right. Uh, great. So, um, you know, uh, before uh, we get on to the next question, I'd like to share that uh, uh, when I was working with GIC in Singapore, uh, the office had more cubicles. And what was very interesting for me is that to see that uh, literally it was like a home of a person. So there were a lot of photo frames, some had Hello Kitty uh, posters. Um, there used to be an entire lineup of shoes and wardrobe lying uh, near the desks because a lot of people use the MRT there. So, you know, they would change their shoes. And mm -hmm. it was really interesting. I had never seen that. And um, I think it was kind of cute. At the same time, I do sometimes like uh, open layouts as well. You could just shout across to your colleague and it just makes interaction uh, more open, I feel. All right, also, so, also, sorry. Uh, just one other point about it is that as social distancing norms uh, will be followed, uh, typically most uh, offices cannot right now afford to become 100% uh, occupancy, uh, even if they wish to, because uh, some of the seats would have disappeared. So I think what's going to really happen is a lot of the companies are going to work on shifts, uh, but then the question of, sanitizing uh, workstations which are going to be shared by two different sets of people comes into play. Um, industry is already responding to it with mats that kind of cover the tables and the workstation which can then be removed completely, sanitized okay. and a new uh, new one, new mat put into uh, that place for the next shift to come in and uh, start working. So. Um, I think it's not going to be so easy an answer whether a uh, cubicle will disappear or will remain. But in the interim, uh, definitely you're going to see a drop in the occupancies of uh, most offices. All right. Uh, so this, it's interesting. So are these uh, transparent mats like uh, stick on and pull on? Like would you just stick them on your entire workstation and pull them off when you leave? I believe so. I mean, I'm, quite frankly, I have not seen them. Um, I've done some research on it uh, because one of our clients was talking about it. Uh, and our team had actually pulled out some vendors who are uh, providing those uh, mats right now. Uh, but they are they are transparent and, you know, uh, but of course you have to put disposable uh, bins where, where they get thrown and it's your responsibility to throw it before you. Oh, so I think that's very interesting. That's also a very cost-effective solution for most organizations. Right. Great. Uh, so having discussed what, uh, you know, the trend is going to be like in terms of layouts, uh, if you could shed a little bit more light, DV, on what you think are going to be, let's say, medium to long-term design changes that would come about uh, especially when we talk about common areas and um, if the way we design commercial real estate is going to change per se. Uh, also, if you could, uh, you know, help a lot of uh, people, uh, um, especially students, so one of them has posed the question as well, how easy is it to be actually flexible in design midway? Uh how easy it is to be flexible in design midway. Right. Uh, so let's say uh, you are going to look at certain changes in uh, the medium term in yeah. design. But yeah. also, let's say, do shed some light on if a project is already undergoing uh, design and we do know that design also have a longish life cycle as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So how can uh, people <clears throat> tackle these two things? Okay, so I, I will, I'll take about five minutes uh, talking about this. So um, you have to look at the office uh, from the whole process of an employee uh, entering into the premises and then right up to his work, work desk and the day that he spends in office and then goes back. Uh, when you look at it from that perspective, um, the, one of the key items here is to have absolute contactless movement as well as the ability to maintain social distance with any other people who are uh, coming in. So we have already spoken about installation of sanitization stations at the entrance 
uh, thermal scanners and other scanners that are coming to play. Um, there is already uh, talk about uh, putting entrance mats, uh, which are 12 feet long, because those 12 feet long uh, would then uh, sanitize your shoes before you actually enter the office. So uh, in terms of design, uh, a number of offices, uh, office buildings today uh, do have the vestibule, uh, which typically tends to be anywhere between 10 to 11 feet in any case. So uh, those will add uh, to uh, to that. And there's not much design change per se that you, that you really need to do there. Uh, the elevators today are definitely a problem. Um, I believe uh, in terms of design, um, a building which is a central core may actually work better for a simple reason that uh, the, co the lift lobbies tend to have two sides to them, then. at least in design uh, as a typical floor they do have. So what happens then is that you are able to organize a one-way movement where how you enter into the elevator lobby and how people come out of the elevator and move out, uh, you know, can be worked out in a one-way direction. Uh, and that way, uh, a central lobby uh, tends to help. Uh, elevators, I think there's a lot of work that uh, elevator companies are doing. We've been talking to some of them uh, about how you can use RFID, how you could use uh, other functions like mobile application for uh, getting people to move. Uh, we should not forget that the uh, capacity for each of these elevators will drastically reduce. Um, one would expect a longer waiting time as you uh, go up uh, to your office building. Um, I don't think uh, one would be able to change that at this point in time, at least in existing building. The question automatically would be uh, that when you design new buildings, do you design more elevators because you're going to have less capacity per elevator? Um, I, I think uh, that's, that's not a right way of looking at it. Um, I think the way to look at it is if you design for a lower occupancy, then you design for uh, obviously the same number of elevators. But if the occupancy does increase, then the elevator capacity would also you know, increase because what social distancing you're maintaining in your office will be automatically translated uh, to those elevators. So while some think that number of elevators go up, I don't believe it'll go up. I think it'll, it'll probably remain the same, but there will be more uh, uh, look towards the destination control because you are then to a computer, uh, to an algorithm actually able to control the number of people that actually can go into an elevator. So most people understand that and it's already uh, prevalent today uh, in terms of what the other concern that a lot of people do have, uh, and that is going to undergo a lot of change, uh, the toilets, because probably the most difficult thing uh, to do in terms of the design. So uh, eliminating the door of the toilet, uh, what we've observed uh, in, in some of the design changes that we're already undertaking is that uh, most clients would now want the toilet doors or the entrance door to be eliminated. Now. Most people would have observed in airports, uh, that is already the case. In offices, when you design toilets, you tend to design it as, as uh, compact as possible uh, because you want to uh, make the floor as efficient as possible. When you do this without doors, then you need a lot more screening. And therefore, the toilet sizes would increase. Now, that would impact the efficiencies of floor plates. But that's one way of uh, looking at it. The other way of looking at it is uh, work on the hardware of these doors by having them automatic, uh, automatically opening doors. Um, difficult, uh, but it is possible to do that. Um, we also observe that uh, while the elevators may be an issue, a lot of the people may well choose to use the staircase uh, simply because of social distancing and the sense of it. Um, what we think, therefore, can be done with some of these staircases, which tend to be all fire fire escape stairs, is that your doors, uh, which uh, which you have in those, would either have to be an automatic opening sensor based opening doors, or you use the hardware to keep it hold open, uh, so that it closes only in case of fire, but kind of keeps it open uh, during most of the. So people are then more encouraged to walk up the stairs, at least the first two, three floors, if not uh, beyond that. 
Um, we are also talking to our uh, MEP consultant, uh, like Kunal, uh, whether the pressurization of the stairs can actually be converted to pumping in more fresh air. The pressurization really works only during the fire case, but it's a fan that's just sitting there, uh, you know, uh, but we could use uh, that fan to now uh, see if we can uh, bring in more fresh air to these enclosed staircases or fire escape staircases. And also uh, do the same uh, because mandatorily for fire, we have to do the pressurize the uh, elevators. Uh, so those shafts can also be uh, kept with a lot more fresh air. So that will bring in some comfort in people's mind and perception uh, when, you, when you talk about it. Um, elevators can also have ionizing uh, 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 devices uh, that, that suck away some of the uh, germs and bacteria and virus uh, that are in the air. Um, there are now products available which you coat over your handrail, over your buttons, uh, something called a liquid guard that holds for about five, six months um, and keeps it free of any virus and bacteria for some time to come. So there are views like that uh, that, that we are all looking at. Um, we are also uh, looking at the material uh, that we use in our offices. Um, I think uh, a lot of people believe that carpets and soft fabrics uh, are really bad uh, for, for uh, this kind of uh, situation. I do have a slightly contrarian view. Um, this virus is, at least this virus and probably other viruses too, um, would tend to stick on to hard surfaces more than they would stick on to porous surfaces. Now, if an organization has a cleaning regimen which keeps cleaning hard surfaces on a regular basis, then maybe hard surfaces are a good way to go, to use stone or marbles or tiles that you want to do. But uh, the one advantage of carpet is that it absorbs its porous. It's less likely to transmit virus to you than a hard surface today. Uh, and but carpets require long-term maintenance. So it's then you have to think about what kind of carpets to do. So, you know, just, just an offshoot, in a healthcare situation where you're doing a hospital, you use hard surface because the typical cleaning regimen is far more stronger and heavier than an office. So it's better there because it will get cleaned off. The virus will be cleaned off of the surfaces uh, like stone floorings and walls. But when it comes to offices, uh, I think there's a mixed bag, whether you use carpet or stone. I, I probably don't think there's one right way or wrong. I think it's an operational issue. Uh, different organization will choose to uh, look at it differently. Um, coming back to the washrooms, we just spoke about the entrance, but there are other elements of washrooms uh, which are problematic. So contactless soap dispensers, contactless uh, faucets are already known. I, I, that's a no-brainer. We are already using it. Many, many uh, public toilets already have it. The WC cubicles are a problem and they are still a problem. I, I don't think there is a solution for it yet, um, you know, in terms of door hardware. Um, I have, we have recommended uh, on existing buildings that uh, we mount a paper towel dispenser near the door so that those can be used as you go in. Um, uh, the health faucet, which most Indians do use, are a problem because you touch them. So maybe additional sanitizer within the cubicles are, are an important thing. Uh, you do get now WCs which uh, incorporate an automatic uh, jet uh, I mean, in place of the health faucet, but those are expensive stuff. Uh, not probably affordable in most commercial cases. Uh, but, I mean, you can do that in hotels and maybe residential. Uh, but those are not things that, that, that we can do uh, in most of the spaces. Um, again, uh, there are other measures that we will have to uh, look at how, how much you can automate uh, door openings even within your office, uh, how you can use some of the foot uh, handles that are, uh, okay, the word handle is probably wrong, uh, footles uh, that you can fix uh, to doors to open, right. open doors. So, a number of changes. I think those are uh, design changes that are that are already on the anvil. Uh, we are already doing it, um, and, and, and we'll have to see the long-term changes like reduction in occupancy. I don't think people are 
talking about yet, even in the new buildings that we are doing. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Devi. Um, my next question is to Amit. Amit, in light of uh, what we've thus far uh, seen in the discussion, what is uh, your uh, short and medium term outlook on demand for commercial real estate? <laughs> okay, that's a tough one. Uh, trying to play Nostradamus here. Um, so look, I mean, pre-COVID, we were already in late stage of a bull run in the office sector. And I think a cyclical downturn was around the corner. Uh, COVID has definitely accelerated it. Uh, we are now officially in recession, I think in India after 40 years. Um, I think in the short term, and let's call it 12 months, companies will preserve cash. And also they will not take any huge decisions uh, because of the uncertainty. You know, that period of 12 months could become as short as six months. Uh, uh, but I think somewhere between six to 12 months is when companies will see a little more certainty uh, and then start to make big decisions. Uh, so therefore, in 2020, uh, office space absorption is bound to decrease. Um, but looking at the longer term, I think there's a number of factors which honestly, I don't know the answer to. Uh, I'll, I'll you know, lay out the factors and I'll be happy to put a guess on it. But you know what, uh, I, I don't think anybody can answer precisely. Uh, the first is work from home. And I think this is my personal opinion. I think permanently up to 15 to 20 percent of the workforce may start working outside office permanently. I think that's a possibility in a tech driven environment and a technology driven Indian absorption. Uh, the second I think people are not talking enough about is the rotation policy, which is, for example, you know, companies may say, uh, you know what, this is a good cost saving measure. Why don't we mandate that everyone works from home one day a week, right, as an example. And that itself is a 20 percent saving on the space requirement. So you've got now two factors. Uh, one is permanent work from home and the second is partial work from home which can significantly reduce the requirement for office space. Uh, but then there are counterbalancing factors. And I think the third one, which is important, is the de-densification of the floor plate. Um, you know, I've seen several studies which talk about uh, no more than 20 to 40 percent. And that's, that's the range. Uh, sorry, let me correct that. 28 to 40 percent uh, of the existing uh, sp of the the current space can cater to only 28 to 40 percent of the staff and that can have a huge impact if companies adopt distancing religiously. I think that's the key word. They may or they may not. So it's an unknown. I think the net impact of these three, which is two negative impacts and one significantly positive impact together with how is India's GDP going to recover? And lastly, how will be India's global position, you know, on a relative scale? Will India benefit from COVID or will India not? You know, there'll be a global shift in, you know, decisions of MNCs. I think all of these combined will lead to what is the medium to long term demand for commercial real estate. I think the market may actually shrink slightly, uh, a net result of all of this. Um, but it will then after shrinking will continue to grow at a nominal pace. Uh, but I think there's one final comment I'll make to this, which is flight to quality because the market size may shrink, but for quality developers and quality operators, there is going to be a higher demand than before. We've seen a consolidation, very strong consolidation in the residential market. And I think we'll see significantly more in the office market as well. Therefore, there will be certain players who provide a lot of impetus on design, on health and safety, and they will significantly benefit coming out of this. So that's my view, Kanika. Uh, let me just add one thing to what uh, Amit said about uh, reduction for about 28 to 40 percent. I think uh, I, I can easily validate that because we, we looked at some designs uh, for where existing workstations were. We realized that if you just take the existing workstation and apply social distancing norms, uh, we were reducing 50% of the seats. But if you were to do a fresh office with a 
norm of uh, social distancing and relook the way the workstations are organized, we actually got 60%. So we lost 40% of what we would have normally done uh, previous uh, prior to the social distancing. So that's that's the answer to that 28 to 40. There's a real design. Uh, you could you could see that happen already. Wonderful. Thanks. All right. Great. So uh, I also think that probably large offices may be broken into, let's say, more hub and spoke model. But um, again, I think uh, it's heartening to say that overall the demand would balance out and uh, we would uh, again be in a good position. I would now um, request Amit um, to shed similar light on residential space. Um, what do you think has changed there or is about to change? Okay. Um, I think uh, some of the trends and, you know, uh, behaviors around usage uh, that we spoke about in the commercial space equally apply to the residential sector as well. Um, so I would point out uh, probably three areas where the residential will be directly impacted. These are again my personal opinions. I think number one, the home size will increase. Um, you know, between 2012 to now, we've had significant affordability issues and various cities have, uh, you know, shown smaller apartment sizes. So Gurgaon moved from being a four bedroom house uh, market to a three BHK market. Bangalore moved from a three BHK to a two BHK. Bombay moved from a staple two BHK market to a one BHK market. Uh, but now with the stagnant housing prices for so many years and, you know, salaries have continued to increase due to inflation affordability is a lot better in real terms. And in addition, when you look at the COVID related quality and safety concerns and the need for more space and the need for balconies and the need for a work from home and home office, I think that houses will get bigger by about half a room to a one room. So half a room, call it a study or one bedroom extra. Uh, you know, I, I think I can see the home sizes again becoming bigger over the next few years. Uh, the second is quality and um, you know quality in emerging markets like India is uh, pretty synonymous uh, with cost. So when we've promoted low cost housing, which of course is the need of the hour for the masses, uh, but what's also happened is that the quality of housing has suffered. Uh, people have made you know decisions, cut corners, uh, you know the choice of materials used, the choice of contractors, not taking time to think through because they're in a rush to get the capital out. Margins are sh you know uh, low. Uh, quality has suffered, and I think this has been going on gradually for the last seven to eight years. And I think we are now at a turning point where this will reverse for the next several years. I think quality housing, and you know, may I say, dare I say, premium housing will be back in favor. I predict next year. The third impact I see, Kanika, is uh, location preference. And uh, I think customers will strongly prefer to stay near their workplace. Um, our studies in the past, and this is the old world, uh, it's shown that the location of homes was being significantly determined by non-office goers. Um, so if a decision maker is a single or it's a dink couple, I mean, double income, no kids, then it's a different matter. But other than that, if you're looking at joint families or if you're looking at full families with kids or parents, uh, then the considerations were very different. It was proximity to schools for the kids. It was proximity to healthcare and community facilities for the elderly. Uh, decisions were made on proximity to shopping facilities for the homemakers. But I think COVID has made us uh, rethink about the use of public transport for extended periods of time. And again, I go back to what Kunal was saying about being in a confined space with other people. So, you know, in other words, if you're using a metro for one hour to commute to work up and one hour down, uh, people will start thinking of that as almost equal to taking a flight. Uh, now, obviously, it's not going to be completely avoidable, uh, but I think people will prefer to be closer to work uh, and therefore choose, you know, things like integrated townships uh, or a mixed use project, which, you know, I know Heinz loves to do and we will do. Uh, or generally just a you know housing condominium or a location which is closer to their workplace. It's now an important consideration. It was not a consideration earlier. So those are my views on uh, you know what changes we can expect in the resi sector. All right, great. Uh, thank you, Amit. Uh, uh, so uh, I have a surprise. We're going to again launch an audience poll on that and let's see uh, what 
the audience begs the demand to be so sajal please have that uh, out there great uh, so let's take a few seconds to just answer this uh, the question to the audience is what will happen to demand in the next 18 months there's a biased quiz uh, kanika there's no option to say increase substantially or significantly <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> i think that's um, been which what, is probably what most of the panelists here want want to happen you know wish to happen absolutely uh, yes. so do i actually so the moderator also wants that uh, great so while the audience is answering uh, that um, dv i just um, ask you to shed light on how you think uh, the space within an apartment would change from design perspective you've already shed light on uh, common areas we'd love to hear your thoughts on how design within an apartment is going to change okay um i'll start by a much more theoretical idea so uh, most i mean most people when when they go from outside to inside their home there's a layer that they go through there's public and there's semi public and then private i think what what is going to happen in all our apartments as i see it today uh, when design demand comes in is public semi public semi private and then private uh, so there's a extra layer that will that will probably go into these uh, homes what does that mean uh, to me that means that uh, you know the creation of a foyer within within the entrance hall um, for long um, as, as amit also mentioned the four bedroom becoming three bedroom and three bedroom becoming two bedroom in some of our cities one of the areas that we lost uh, while we began to design uh, units more and more efficient is the foyer the foyer is that semi private space that distinguishes between what is just outside and what is fully uh, inside um what what we see is that the foyer will come into play because uh habitually people would want to leave their footwear uh, somewhere in the nether zone which is nether in nether nor out uh, so the footwear a space for footwear south indians always did that most south indian homes always expected the footwear to remain outside but i think across the country uh, you probably uh, have something like that happening so the fire comes into play um interestingly nobody has yet asked us uh, but i believe that somebody is going to ask for uh, a powder room or a washroom uh, right next to the foyer uh, many of you who are already going back to work would know that when you reach home the first thing you do is straight away march yourself into the washroom into the toilet and have a bath so i think if that perceives or that perception remains uh, that we will uh, we will need to take a bath as soon as we reach home before we touch or get into contact with anything else uh, some of the foyers you may want to combine with uh, with powder rooms or a washroom where at least the least you can do is wash your hands before you actually uh, get in uh, the third thing that i believe that one would look at is uh, and that's where affordability comes into play because a lot of people uh, may or may not be able to afford larger homes just because they have this new Uh, element of working from home um so when you look at it from that perspective people look at how they can use the space in the day it's a work from home at night it becomes your bedroom um, how do you transform that you transform that with modular furnitures with furniture that that can be adapted now um, in in high density cities like hong kong and uh, tokyo Uh, you already know that these things exist because people simply cannot afford the square footage to have a bedroom separate a dining room separate and a living room separate so uh, now that the element of work is also coming into play a lot of the people may or may not be able to afford to create uh, but we will look at transforming their spaces uh, over the time so from morning to evening to night uh that may that may happen um uh, one other aspect we've gone through this almost every families which have small kids 
is the mental state of these kids who simply are not able to go out to play. Uh, what do they do? I mean, how, how do parents manage to keep up their spirits? Uh, so, you know, the outdoor obviously becomes that much more important. Um, I, I could propose that balconies become a little wider and therefore become a little more useful uh, for people. Of course, that has cost and FAR and other implications in various cities, uh, depending on the bylaws. But it could be an idea that, that would need to be looked at if you want to provide that extra outdoor space, which you are not able to use in your common areas. Uh, right. Of course, with, with that would come safety and security. So you look at uh, how, how the parapet heights are, and you, know, you have a lot of incidents of children falling off. So you, you have to get into that. But I think if uh, extra outdoor is something that you have to do within your homes, uh, then that's something that, that I think will, will, be, uh, will be a change that we will uh, soon see in our apartments as we, as we move forward. Yeah. Great, DV. Thank you so much. Um, so, Amit, uh, I'd like to share that the audience is fairly divided in terms of the design, uh, sorry, demand for uh, residential, uh, but uh, most of them say it may just fall marginally in the next 18 months. I think um, I well, if you did the uh, poll before my answers, uh, I think the responses would have been different. So, <laughs> thanks for giving okay, me the okay. opportunity to share my views. Well, before. Great. I'll just uh, quickly move on to Kunal now because, uh, you know, and um, I've been reading the questions that have been coming and Kunal uh, has already been asked 15 to 20 questions. Uh, Pandas, uh, be res uh, sorry, the audience, please be rest assured that I'm asking uh, these questions now. Um, so Kunal, um, you did tell us uh, that, uh, you know, uh, HVAC essentially has four elements we need to look at. Uh, uh, one is uh, more air changes and more outdoor air. Uh, second is keeping the right temperature and humidity. Uh, third is the right filtration. And fourth is the disinfection. Um, I would request if you could again in uh, simple language for a non-engineer like me, tell us how the first three mechanisms need to change uh, to address the COVID situation? Yeah, uh, Kanika, as far as the, the, the first point is concerned, which is basically increasing outdoor air delivery, you know, you need to keep in mind that more outdoor air that you bring into an air-conditioned space, your heat load or the, the load demand also goes up. So as a retrofit, you should have that infrastructure to be able to get in more outdoor air. That's one. Second thing is we need to be cognizant of the fact that, again, the pollution levels are still going to go up after this pandemic is over and, and already the, the PM levels are going much higher than what they were during the lockdown. So, so we need to address uh, pollution as well. So it's not a very simple thing to do, but whatever uh, pressure that the systems have been designed for, especially for the uh, current buildings, I think you need to maximize that. And if there are any buildings, like I know, uh, with uh, one horizon center, I think Amit will know that, you know, you have a demand control ventilation, which is in place where you're basically modulating the amount of fresh air coming into the building to optimize your, your operational cost, your load, and also to, to try and prevent, you know, pollution from entering the space. But that needs to be disabled for the current uh, pandemic situation, because, you know, you need to be able to dilute the amount of virus, which is there in an enclosed environment say an office or, or whatever. So we need to make sure that the demand control ventilation is shut down. And for all existing buildings, whatever design pressure has been planned, that much as a bare minimum is coming in constantly when, when the air conditioning is on. That's one. Uh, second thing is going forward, when we, when we do you know, uh, design new buildings, we would probably increase the amount of fresh air and, and filter that fresh air coming into the space to make sure that you know, any future situation of this sort is negated in the design itself. Um, the second point is uh, regarding the temperature in RH. You know, the RH range of 40 to 70 percent in most Indian cities would be achieved if you maintain or, or set your air conditioner at 24, 25. You know, that's how psychrometrics work. And I want to just again reiterate that setting a temperature on an AC of 24 to, 20, to say about 30 or Maintaining an RH of 40% to 70% is actually not doing anything to the virus. All it's doing is when you have droplets settling on surfaces, 
is preventing a very low RH will increase the chance of uh, infection spread because the droplets would dry out much faster because the RH is low and the air would have the tendency to pick up that moisture and then the virus from the surface can become airborne. So that's, that's the second point. But it is a recommendation and, and we should adhere to that when we are operating buildings, including my office building right now is operating at about 25 uh, degrees Celsius. And the third point is on filtration. Now, you know, the, I, I've had multiple questions from multiple people, uh, even on this uh, Q&A here, uh, and many clients of the last two, three months. So you need to understand, you need to go back to the size of the virus. The size of the virus is extremely, extremely small. Um, I've heard people talk about and, and including uh, Ishray has been talking about an MERB 13 filter. It will not catch the virus. Um, the efficiency for that filter is 95% for 3 micron. That is 25, 30 times bigger than the current, part, current virus size. And it is a media filter. Even a HEPA filter, a lot of people must have heard about HEPA filters being put by Airbus and planes and things like that. You need to again understand the efficiency of a HEPA filter, which is a MERV 17 grade filter or, or above. The efficiency of a HEPA filter is 99.97% down to 0 0.3 micron. It is still not good enough to capture this virus effectively at that efficiency. And these filters cannot be retrofitted in existing air handlers in, in, in commercial buildings or even in residential buildings because of their pressure drop. So, so for retrofitting, we do have a problem. Uh, I don't want to sound completely, uh, you know, without hope here, but we do have filters which are in place, which are certified for the COVID-19 virus that can be retrofitted in the handling units uh, called ion jet filters. Okay, and they can filter, they are nano level filters and electronic filters. So they don't have much of a pressure drop. They have a three mm water gauge pressure drop and they can filter PM.1, which is roughly the size of this virus with about 96%, 96, 97% efficiency on a single pass. And it not only traps the virus, it kills the virus. So, so any media filter, whether it's an MERV 13, whether it's a HEPA filter, is just trapping the virus. It's not killing it, which makes the filter also a biohazard in the current situation, because if it's trapping it, and my maintenance guy, uh, like, you know, how much maintenance people will go and clean these filters, for example, in, in one horizon center, if they are not in proper PPE and the virus is caught and they can get caught on this, uh, on these filters, some of it, not hundred percent, maybe 10%, maybe 20%, that becomes a biohazard for the person who's actually pulling that filter out and cleaning it. So we need to be, uh, categorical on that. Iron jet filters, unfortunately are expensive. They are very, very expensive. And uh, they, they range from somewhere in the region of 120 rupees a CFM, um, which is six or seven times the cost of a standard MERV 13 filter. But they, but you know, you need to also understand like, uh, you know, developers like Amit and, and you know, architects like DV, they can convince their clients if they can, because media filters are replaceable. You know, they need to be, they have a lifetime, uh, 16 to 18 months, they need to be thrown out and new ones need to be put in. Iron jet filters have life about 10 to 12 years, but as a, as a consulting engineer, as a designer, I will not recommend start uh, that you start putting all your issues with iron jets in highly critical applications like healthcare facilities, where you have most of the problems today, you may want to opt for iron jet filters and you can have active disinfection mechanisms while people are sitting there, um, in offices or in malls or in you know, schools, for example or universities that can still take the fight to the virus and kill it off surfaces and air. Uh, I think that would be uh, the more, you know, direct approach. And wherever it's extremely critical, healthcare facilities, testing laboratories, biosafety labs, clean rooms, I would say that the ion jet could be put as a solution in the AHOs where, you know, the cost could be justified. Um, I want to just, you know, bring, bring to notice that I think there was a question regarding disinfection also in, in the group and someone, someone has, uh, I think someone I know probably has asked me about hydroxyl radicals. And yes, I've been that was 
sorry that was going to be my next question to you what is your solution for disinfection yeah so you know i i, I said this before like i can't start spraying uh, sodium hypochlorite like the up government did on on the migrants initially right i mean that's not something i'm going to do uh, as an engineer it doesn't work jokes apart like you know you need to use some solutions that are human friendly and when i say human friendly it should not do any harm to plants animals and human beings and that needs to be taken up responsibly and there are toxicology studies for um hydroxyl radicals that prove that they do not do any harm to the human beings or plants or animals uh they are naturally occurring and anybody with, with google can can go online and check this uh, you know for themselves as well and um they naturally occur and they're known as the detergent of of the environment and they do clean up bacteria viruses etc what hydroxyl radicals primarily do with the covid uh, covid 19 causing virus which is the sars and cov 2 is basically the rna when it's exposed it dies instantaneously so we need to just prick the you know the the lipid profile the the, the lipid layer rather of the virus with the hydroxyl the hydroxyl is highly highly unstable and it has a half life of about maximum 7 8 seconds and it just needs to go somewhere and and saturate itself so what it does to the virus is it takes picks the protein layer picks one hydrogen off and disengages it and there are technologies available now which are which have been there in the market for a while because of sars cov 1 so when the sars pandemic or the epidemic hit in 2005 these technologies have been um you know developed but because till now we don't even have a vaccine for sars so so it was not that uh, big a problem i would say so these technologies never kicked on but sars cov 2 so luckily we have that technology ready today and uh, some of these are are certified for coronavirus by international labs like the university of barcelona virology lab uh, there's a product that i'm aware of uh, that is us fda approved for 99.9% efficiency for surfaces and air using hydroxyl radicals so so that technology is there it's available it's not for homes and and uh, things it's for public areas where we going out at homes i would say you know you can put a small radical hydroxyl radical generator at the foyer like bb mentioned or or where you enter just so that you're disinfected you know at the source and these machines need to run 24 by 7 365 days till we have till all of us have a shot in the arm for this virus that's that's how i see it yeah all right uh great kunal uh thank you so much um uh for summing up the solution for air conditioning uh, because uh, even in the q and a i saw most of the people had uh, questions around it um i think um we've answered most of the questions that uh, attendees have posed to us so um little fun time now um quick rapid fire uh, uh karan johar style i would say uh so i'm going to ask this question to all of you and um, i'll ask each one of you individually uh, starting with amit uh this is basically a check of your uh, netflix uh, prime and hotstar question so amit have you seen um, the following starting with the bollywood's favorite money heist shark tank and uh, of course sacred games india's favorite uh yes money heist season 1 uh sacred games yes both seasons uh shark tank not yet all right great so that's two out of three uh dv i'm going to give a very very boring answer i've never worked more harder than the time that i was in lockdown we were working 14 to 16 hours i'm quite happy to be back in office because my time is 9 to 6 uh and i can go back and relax in fact i am only now beginning to watch tv there was hardly any tv time in the 40 days that we were locked okay so dv i'm going to send a chromecast and a netflix uh, slash prime coupon to you today uh, kunal <laughs> what is your take um my take is i mean i've i've been busy with my studying and i'm still carrying a lot of paperwork so i've not had a lot of time are you busy with this 
Yeah, well, no, this was 10 15 years back. So, yeah, no, they're, they're, they're very to nice. uh, all the attendees, <laughs> Kunal has written uh, two romantic novels as well, so he's not uh, all that technical. And uh, it's called In Memory of uh, In Fond Memory of Myself, and the other one is Running Around in Circles. That so, was the first book, yes, Running Around in Circles was the first book which I wrote probably in 2008. Um, I still don't know why, but but yeah, I did. And then I wrote another follow-up book in 2009, uh, which is after, which is about afterlife. But right now, I'm 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 quite focused on on the task at hand. We we've, we've got a burning issue in front of us, and and whatever support we can give from an engineering perspective to um, the country, to the construction industry, uh, that'll be and that's what my focus is today. So maybe the third book right. has to wait. And, Great. Uh, so, but uh, you didn't answer uh, Netflix. Uh, have I've you watched not, these three? I, I honestly haven't watched any series through the lockdown. I've seen a couple of movies. I saw a movie called Ban Maska, which was pretty nice. All right. Great. Anika, your question Great. was not precise enough. Your question was not related to having seen these flicks during the lockdown. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I've seen both of these before the lockdown. What I've seen during the lockdown is Fada. Okay. Great. All right, great. And uh, you, just, can, you can you can see that uh, how how hard consultants are working. Both the consultants yes. really didn't do any any Netflix during the time. <laughs> yes. So just um, a minute more. Um, what hobby did you pick up during lockdown? Starting with you, Amit. Uh, playing cards with our daughter. Uh, so we do it every evening, and uh, she's already picked up poker, and uh, we're working okay. on blackjack next. <laughs> okay, so yes, so money is ringing in the family. I can see that. Uh, DV, how about you? Nearly exactly the same thing, except it wasn't poker and blackjack, but few other games that that runs in my family uh, over over centuries. Actually, I mean over decades. Tambola? Uh, no, card games. Actually, okay. I, I I actually taught my eleven year old and thirteen year old some card games that I inherited from my grandparents at some point. And Kunal? Yeah. I oh. have, so I, I play cricket on weekends in Gurgaon and that has stopped uh, for three months. And uh, so I've learned how to hold the bat and shadow practice again after 20 years. So, so that's another hobby that I've picked up. Uh, so I'm playing cricket alone, basically. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you to all the attendees as well. Um, uh, I hope all your questions are answered. I did my best to pick up uh, what I could from the Q&A. Uh, thank you, Amit, DV, and Kunal uh, once again for your expert views. And uh, last but not the least, thank you very much speaking for uh, organizing this. And um, I hope it uh, benefited the larger audience. Well done, Kanika. Uh, thanks to everyone. And you know, to all the audience, stay home, stay safe. All right, great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Yeah, thank you. Everyone, Bella Ciao.